I was born in Ketchikan in Alaska and I was raised in, in the village of Metlakatla uh, by my full-blood Simshian grandparents, Albert and Dora Bolton. They were my heroes, they were my, my saviors. I just, uh, I spent all my time with them. I was one of those uh, kind of square pegs looking for a round hole kind of a guy, you know. I was always with my, uh, my grandma and grandpa. Uh, when other kids were out doing other things, I was hunting and fishing and picking berries and subsistence stuff like that. And, and uh, my grandparents were uh, born in the 1800s and uh, I was very fortunate to be raised by them from, from two days old. And um, in, in that village, uh, our village uh, lost, uh, uh, totally lost its culture because of uh, missionary influence and government influence and mostly missionary influence. Our people moved from British Columbia in the uh, late 1800s to Alaska with an Anglican missionary. So I was lucky though. I was lucky to be raised by these wonderful old, old folks and uh, they're with me still every day. And my grandfather was there when I started carving. He showed me how to cut trees, cut the cedar down and helped me with my first few attempts, uh, totem poles, and, and that kind of thing. My journey to where I am now took a big turn back in the 80s, and I uh, was a school teacher, basketball coach, and, and that, and I, I decided uh, that the art had taken over, and it was very important. I was becoming more and more involved in, in a revival of our, of our culture, and I was fortunate that way. I came along at the right time when our, our village, uh, my people, needed some kind of guide to be able to live and produce our culture again. I uh, grew up without it. You know, my, my mother's generation, the generation uh, before that, were pretty much uh, pressed down and uh, weren't able to feel that pride and knowledge that, that the great, you know, my grandparents' parents ha had. It was a lot, it's pretty sad, but uh, my son's generation uh, is, uh, has taken the mantle and, and the torch and from, from me and my, the pe uh, those who uh, we work together to try to bring this, some of this back. And, and my son and his generation uh, are very active in, uh, in trying to save our language and uh, what's li what very small little is left of it and singing and dancing and, and, the, and the arts. We're learning now, the work I've been doing with language revitalization, we're learning now that uh, they're actually studying the effects of language loss, land loss, when you know, people are torn away from their traditional territories. And that is so traumatic that it actually alters your DNA. Like your, your uh, you know, um, genes are turned on or off from that level of trauma. It happens to people that, you know, go to war, it happens to, you know, any, anything that's more than your mind can kind of handle. And when a whole people are made to feel ashamed of who they are and told that their traditions aren't their, you know, their land's not theirs anymore, it's all ripped from you, that affects people. And so, like the old wives' tale that Native people are more susceptible to alcoholism, no, they're not. They're traumatized people who are trying to cope, and that's one of the ways people could cope. But we're finding that heritage language reacquisition and reclaiming our culture can, even generations down the road, heal those traumas. So that's one of the, the ways we're going about this now is on top of we just, you know, we feel it's important we reclaim our language and cultural identity. It'll actually, like, um, there was a study done in Canada where uh, villages where a native language is heard every day, suicide rates drop to zero. There was a, a man up in southeast Alaska who's a very influential man named Walter Sobolov, and he said, you know, if you know who you are, you don't hurt yourself. You know, so that's, that's the kind of stuff that we're dealing with, and it's the kind of thing that, that we need uh, empathy and, and help. When I met Chris, not only, not only is he the best artist in, 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 for what he does, best painter I've ever seen, he's one of the nicest human beings that I've ever met because he's such a good and kind, genuine person. And then uh, he began to create 
paintings, artwork that reflected my culture. He uh, did a series of paintings from my, my family, my dance group, and then uh, he did for a, a collector a, a, a number of really large uh, paintings that depicted tribes from, from the Puget Sound up into Alaska. My friendship with him is based on mutual admiration and uh, he's very respectful and uh, he's just a good guy. He's just a good guy. There have been lots of people who have done uh, paintings of Northwest Coast people. Most of the time it's historical, kind of, you know, what they think it, things used to look like and that. And while Chris has done a few of those, he's done them in consultation with us or with the other tribes he's painted. But I think more than that, he's really captured who we are, not who we used to be. Too often we're represented in these over-romanticized ways or, or too anthropologically clinical kind of ways. And, and when we see his paintings of us, I really feel like he's captured us as a living people now. And uh, that means a lot, I think, to us too, on top of, on top of just being his friends. All we want is to be listened to and for people to have empathy. You know, put yourself in our shoes. How would you feel if? And um, Chris's approach of actually talking to us and hearing what, what we are, why we are, why we do what we do, and interpreting that that way, rather than studying us from afar and making assumptions about who we are and what, what we do. That's, that's, it makes an enormous difference. And I, I would suggest to anybody that if you just talk to somebody, you'll find out that there's probably more that you can agree on or at least understand about each other. We need allies. And Chris is the good kind of ally for, for our people. We're not a static old uh, culture that isn't alive. We're alive and living our culture and we're using these same, same objects for the same reasons, trying to tell our stories. And uh, when I first uh, started doing my research in, in uh, museums, and I've done that a lot, that's how I've learned most of what I know, is just copying old, old things. I didn't have very uh, much instruction for the most part. I wish I had, I'm not bragging about that, I wish I had. It was harder to go, to learn on your own. But most of what I know I've learned from looking at old pieces in museums and, and a number of the pieces that we use, that we dance with, are pieces that I replicated from, from museum collections. And, and another thing, in the old days, there were no dance groups in, in, in the ancient times. They were families and they, and they danced and they sang their the rites that they had to sing uh, f during those uh, ceremonies and potlatches. Now there are dance groups, hundreds of dance groups up and down the northwest coast from all the tribes and uh, the, one of the benefits from that is the revitalization of our art and the other is the, re are the revitalization of our language at least in, in, the, in, the, in the young people learning and singing, saying the words and hopefully understanding what they're saying, not just rote memory, you know. And, and so the, the, uh, the combination like this of the art and, and ceremonies uh, has, has lifted us up. You know, it's, what, it's what brought us back from, you know, our people were made to feel ashamed, you know, that when my grandmother was growing up, I don't know if they were still around when you were a kid, but there's signs in Ketchikan, you know, no, no dogs or Indians allowed and that kind of thing. And, um, uh, you know, people were beaten for speaking their language. So there's a, there was a shame that was beaten into us. And carving and dancing and the, our visual arts were an immediate, tangible, thing we could grab onto and um, look at what, well, look what we can be proud of. The art first and then performance art helped pull us out of that time period and, and now it's on us to, to go deeper and save the language and the reasons for the art. In the old days there were the reasons for it and then we would make the art for the reasons. 
in order to bring the culture back, the art has gone first. And now we're, we're building back the reasons for the art. You know, the stories that, that make it why we have the crests we have or why we put up the totem poles or, um, you know, what songs belong to what people. All that stuff uh, is, is coming back behind the art. And I'm very grateful to the art for that. But um, like I said, now, um, you know, if we don't save the language, then, then the meaning for all of this goes away because it's our language that makes us who we are. And our culture is so much like Clinket culture or Haida culture that, you know, if, if you didn't hear us talking, you might not be able to tell the difference. Um, it's our language that makes us Tsimtsian. Sim Aliyah is the name of our language. Sim means real and Aliyah is talk or, or language. Or Sim also can mean true. So depending on how you translate it, real, real the real talk or the true, true talk. One of the things that has happened uh, in, in the last 30, 40 years of, of my life is that to begin with, I had no one I could go to. When, uh, you know, and when you have a vacuum, it's really hard to reconstruct something that there's nothing left. You know, and, and in my village, there was nothing left when it comes to, uh, there, was few, there were a number of, as I grew up, there were a number of fluent speakers, you know, and they're almost all gone now. But the missionary's influence and, and the, the decision of our own people to move away from that in order to be competitive and to make it in this white world uh, was devastating. So when I was trying to, uh, not by myself, but when I was trying to, to bring back this culture because I just loved it and wanted it to live, I didn't want it to go away, you know, and I, I started planning that first potlatch back in the early 80s and, you know, going and asking. I couldn't, I couldn't get any information from any of what you could call the elders, the, the people in their 60s or 70s or 80s. They were the children of the, of the people who followed the missionaries, so they, they had no idea. When I gave that first potlatch in 1982, I never even had been to a potlatch. I'd ne I never, you know, I, I didn't know what was going on. You know, it was all uh, I research, looking in museums and looking, reading books about what it was like. You know, and then I, I tried, I got mixed up between different tribe, tribal styles and things like that too. But I tried to learn as much as I could from as many sources as I could, and then put it together. It was, it was uh, kind of a what do you call it? Hail, hail Mary! I threw a hail Mary, and I, you know, I just hoped that it would be caught. I hope the ball would be caught on the other end. But uh, that's that's to me that's one of the most significant things about what has happened is sitting right here. Netipkitikat, we caught it. A yelled canoe that will jabba chantni go na jabu. I am fortunate to be able to have done everything that I've done. Nukutsis mask do wear you. Metal cattle Alaska do will watku. A local Tsimsiano. A local Ajik Sagoru. Khani go na zaps. Na skusku. Na silgidu. Gwa. My name is David Boxley. I'm, a, I'm from Metlakatla, Alaska. I'm very proud of my son and the things that he has done. So, I believe that he has gone further than I have with the language because he's working on it every day, you know, and, and I, I have 100% faith that he is going to be a fluent speaker and he's going to be the future to teach those who are not, not yet born. Um, Komt ik goed u tip tip de achter de kiet a kaskau a kaskau a kaskau ama walum tsimsian en schudem 
ak ajik sa kagawdet ak agawil wit agawil wadkem and they will wadkem at a at a num na well num na well kani kani will the Lord him see on. I too feel very fortunate, and um, I, you know, we just want everybody to to know uh, the 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 wealth, the 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 amount of uh, precious um, preciousness <laughs> that we come from as a, as a people. One of the main causes of climate change. And one of the biggest problems I see humanity facing is the same system that told my people we couldn't speak our language and um, that their, our land didn't belong to us anymore and it was theirs to take, manifest destiny. And, and this idea that humanity is a lord of the earth, you know, that we're above all to control all of the animals and all the... Um, that same system is what's caused climate change. This lack of, of feeling connected to the earth, understanding that we're just one species that live on this planet along with all the other species. In Simsian culture, we believed in the old days that when animals went out of our sight and they went to where they lived, they would enter their homes and remove their cloaks that were their animal skins and they looked like us underneath that they, there was a human spirit inside of these animals. And, and a lot of, of uh, indigenous cultures have that, have that sense of, of animals and man being able to go back and forth. And that comes from human beings understand that having to kill something to eat it is a traumatic experience. But if you respect the thing, if you know that, that that they have this soul. When you kill them, there's a ceremony around it. So, like when I, when I hunt deer, when I cut the head off, I angle it back and point it back toward the mountain. And I say thank you, and that, that's its way back home. The spirit can go back to where it came from. Humanity has become so disconnected from the earth itself, and we abuse it in in a totally unsustainable way. It's laughable, and even all this stuff they're trying to do with climate change is not enough. Uh, because it's uh, that money that's lining the pockets of these the people who really control everything, um, and it's shocking to me that that human beings can be so greedy for for this money that that we created. We human beings invented money. I mean, it's not a real thing. We it exists because we say it exists, um, and they would rather have that then ensure that our species can live on a habitable planet, that their great-grandchildren great will have a home to live on. Indigenous people, I feel, have, have an answer to the problems of the world, which is uh, kind of painfully ironic because we were the ones to be pushed away and try, they tried to get rid of us. Meanwhile, that perspective of being connected to the earth is exactly what humanity needs if it's going to survive. The importance of land for our people is that who we are directly comes from the land. The old names for our people have to do with these are the people of this place. Um, and the, the, the people who, the, like the chief of that area, he was, he was responsible for controlling that area his house could could go and gather and hunt and everything in that land. And marriages happened, so uh, you couldn't marry someone of the same clan. One, because at some point you were you had a common ancestor. But the other was that you would then have access to those, your in-laws hunting and fishing grounds and things like that. So land was really important to us. And again, it's one of the, the major traumas of, of colonization it was because uh, land that had been ours for 10,000 years um, wasn't ours to have anymore. Availability of resources. Um, black and red were, were easy to, you know, uh, red oxides or, or red ochres, black charcoals and 
you know, things like that. Blue green from copper. Things things that got out of the earth and were able to mix with salmon eggs and and urine and things like that for to set the colors. Um, it wasn't until the explorers came with their bright paints, white and you know, blues and other colors like that, uh, real bright little uh, shiny paints that our people. Uh, were adapted to to adding those. Our design system, two-dimensional design system, uh, nowadays we call formline. All of our traditional words for it um, are extinct. Um, when the potlatch was banned, uh, potlatch was where everything would be brought out and made public and, and that kind of thing. So when we couldn't do that, the old masters couldn't pass on the traditional techniques, but also there was, you know, the use of those words fell out of use. So they're, they're one of the first uh, casualties of, of uh, our language was the, our words for this two-dimensional design system. But uh, it's called, we call it now a form line after a, a man named Bill Holm wrote a book and, and kind of assigned names to, to different parts of the, of the art form. Um, it's a Deceivingly complex, um, deceivingly simple. It appears simpler than than it actually is. The complex two-dimensional design system made up of a, of a few uh, shapes that can uh, change and be adjusted in a, only a certain set kind of amount of ways, and uh, it they have it has to do with uh, line and weight balance, color balance, and the negative space it creates and all of that combined together is is how we construct these these designs and it was a traded art form so when bentwood boxes would be traded you know full of whatever uh, uh, goods people were trading they would trade the boxes too so the art form went up and down the coast that's why there's um, even though there's different tribal styles this style you see from alaska down to mid british columbia sculptural styles differ more depending on tribal region and those originate from just a number of master carvers and their students. Uh, the ones who were really great and prolific would kind of become known as the tribal style for that region. Uh, there weren't nearly as many carvers in the old days as there are now. Uh, there are lots of carvers nowadays. Um, in the old days it was a high-ranking position there's an old saying that not all chiefs are carvers, but all carvers are chiefs. And we don't claim that or anything nowadays, but, but it, was a, it was an important position. You had to train for it, and not everybody could just do it. Simsan sculptural style tends to be just slightly more realistic. Because of that time period where the old masters couldn't pass things on, we went into kind of a dark, a dark ages. And even though artists continued to make things, model totem poles and, and stuff, the, the level of quality dropped because the old masters hadn't passed on those old techniques. Um, and, and, you know, the, that's where you start to get what you, we think of now as like tourist, tourist art, this, you know, trinket kind of pieces. So dad had to go back past uh, anybody who was alive at the time and look in the museum. So for as much as, you know, it's, it's painful that so much of our, our ancient culture is, is locked away in museums all over the world, um, it also provided us a, an opportunity to actually see them. You know, otherwise they'd be gone. You know, the um, a missionary burned a lot of old things and, you know, we were locked away from all that. So, um, you know, try to find the silver lining and being able to go study these old pieces. If I can understand the old art form and be able to create it new, but in the same style as the old masters, then whatever happens to change, whatever comes out of that understanding, will be the natural progression of the art that should have happened when it was cut off. You know, so we, if we can pick it up there, then we can move forward. And we don't want it to, to stay the same forever, because that's not how a living culture works. Things change and grow and move and, you know, but it has to change and grow and move from that base of understanding that here's, here's how it's done.
The totem pole that we are creating here originated with this model. This is yellow cedar and the larger pieces are red cedar, but uh, they tell the story of a young man it, and the name of the pole and the name of these poles is the boy who fed the eagles. And there's an eagle here and the young man holding a salmon. And he's a part, of, it's a very long story, but he's uh, feeding the eagles and, and they're, they're giving him their feathers for him to use on arrows. You can see on here though, the, the hook beak of the eagle, it's one of the ways you can tell an eagle from a raven in Northwest Coast Art. Ravens are shown with straight beaks and eagles will have a hook turned beak because they have hook beaks in nature. Their, their wings and that are usually designed using form line, two dimensional design. You can see on Simpson poles, we don't use a, a, a lot of paint. The uh, eyebrows, eyes, lips, and nostrils will be painted. The salmon here, even uh, so it, it'll use form line to indicate like the fins and tail, but the salmon itself is fairly sculptural. Simpson work, but a lot of Northwest Coast artwork, whether it's in two dimensions or, or in sculpture, the heads will, will be much larger than in, in real life. And it's just the style of the art form. Tone poles are not, Usually 360, you know, carved all the way around. Most of the time nowadays, we'll flatten the back and hollow it out. It helps prevent rot, trees rot from the inside out. But it also lightens the log, especially if you're going to raise it by hand, like we we do uh, at home. So this this talk two, about yeah, this and stuff. conventional design system is based on two forms, and and a number of uh, secondary forms and. The, 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 the main, the number one form is called an ovoid. And Bill Holm, uh, who has written many, many books and taught at the University of, Wa of Washington for, for many, many years and has influenced uh, many artists, uh, native and non-native, uh, over, over the decades. Uh, he, he calls this a, an ovoid circle or an oval, oval shape. So the ovoid and the U-form are the two main elements of our two-dimensional art system, design system. And then within that system, there are other things that, are, that uh, help to connect this form line system together. And things like stylized faces and areas that are relieved, called reliefs shapes that look like they need to have names on them but are, are mainly uh, carved out like that so that there's not a big giant black space here. It's, this is basically an ultimate relief, this piece here. We, we call it reliefs because again the, the art form is guided by line and thickness balance. So nothing should be thicker than the main ovoid of any uh, of design. So if this ovoid that inside here were filled in black, it would be way too big and heavy for the design. So they're really like this junction here. Uh, if that were to be have left black would be thicker than this section here. So there's a relief put into it. Um, and those are the things, uh, <laughs> that's how you can tell someone knows what they're doing or not. Mm. You know, if you have these, areas that are real lightweight and you got something big, heavy and clunky in it, um, they need to do more study. You know, like, like he was saying too, you know, the, there, are, there are really specific rules. And once you learn the rules, you can create a lot of different things. I mean, you could create elephants and snakes and things that are not part of our culture, but, but you, can, you can create them using this form line system. This is a... a the Empire logo from Star Wars. Did you do that? But yeah, with with you know elements from from our art art style. So I've done you know uh, Superman S's and things like that, but using using form line.